to wait for the guest of honor to appear before I started. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to be talking about work which was done 30, 40 years ago, um, rather than uh, the latest development. So this may be the oldest developments. In any case, to start, I would like to extend once more congratulations to these gentlemen and also to David Dallas, who unfortunately is not here. Uh, I've known all three of them for a long time. Uh, David probably longest. I mean, he was, you know, a Cornell graduate, and Mike was a postdoc at Cornell for a while, and Duncan I mostly ran into in Aspen. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so basically, uh, I feel closest to Mike, uh, basically because we share an interest in climbing. Uh, and uh, here he is as a child, 1963, probably his peak of uh, rock climbing prowess at that time. But anyway, he went on to establish a really major reputation as an alpinist. And probably up until the Nobel Prize, he was, in fact, more famous as a climber than as a physicist. Now, you might find that hard to believe, but he had a amazing reputation, and it's really illustrated by the fact that he was chosen for the cover of the 100th anniversary issue of the Climbers Club magazine, journal, sorry. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, I will, as it says up there, I'll be talking about the uh, series of developments, basically uh, the the onset of superfluidity in three dimensions and two-dimensional systems, contrasting them, and uh, describing, to some extent, the experimental techniques which have developed uh, in the last 100 years to study these, uh, the phenomena in these systems. So uh, along the way, starting really at the beginning, as the liquefaction, oh, same mistake he's making, head. Back we go. OK. The uh, white button is very close to the advance and retard. <laughs> anyway, liquefaction of helium in 1908. And then we come all the way to 1938, 30 years later, before it was realized that this liquid, in fact, had really unusual properties. Up to that time, it had been recognized that there was a, a phase transition. The uh, so-called lambda point uh, was uh, just observed in the heat capacity in uh, 32. And, the <clears throat> and but the discovery of superfluidity really was delayed. And you might ask, why was that? Well, first place, this liquid helium just seemed to be a useful material for cooling other things, particularly superconductors, which, <coughs> which uh, had dramatic uh, zero resistance behavior. <coughs> but uh, after the discovery of the superfluidity through the fountain effect, basically, <coughs> a two fluid model was developed. Uh, based on the ideas of Bose condensation, basically. But if you took a Bose system and lowered its temperature, at some point, the ground state would become occupied, and that would be a model for the superfluid. It, uh, the basic idea, which is, is held true to this day, is that the important thing in describing the superfluid is not the normal fluid, which was the emphasis of <coughs> the Landau, but rather the condensate and the structure of the condensate. Because the superfluid velocity, is what controls the flow of the superfluid, is in fact gradients in the condensate. And so it's important to show that the condensate is a real thing and that uh, observe its properties. Uh, Quantum mechanics enters into the superfluidity problem really just at this level. It's the existence of a condensate. That's basically all you need 
Beyond that, it's basically classical aspects, sort of <coughs> the Costalist view, uh, or in any case. Uh, but important consequence of this condensate is quantization of, of the flow, that the condensate will be single valued unless you make it doubly connected. And this is where topology comes in. So a, a vortex line in the liquid helium is a vortex, is a flow pattern in, determined by the gradients in the condensate. How much momentum is involved in that flow depends on uh, not not just the velocity, but also on the normal fluid density, which depletes the <coughs> momentum that you might expect if you had just a pure condensate throughout the whole system. <coughs> okay, so as things progress, people look, look, <coughs> excuse me, looked again at the uh, heat capacity, and the motivation for this was theories which. Uh, coming out of Australia, actually, which uh, hypothesized that the transition, in fact, would be a rounded transition at a certain length scale. And the predictions were such that uh, the technology of the experimental technology of the time would allow a heat capacity measurement to make, be made at a, close enough to the transition to actually resolve this uh, rounding. It turned out it didn't exist. It's, uh, in fact, the transition is sharp. And so another aspect of the existence of a condensate basically is the persistent currents and the uh, hydrodynamics and decay of persistent currents, which are governed by vortices. And then we come eventually to the phase transition in the 2D system, which turns out to be something really different than what it is in the three-dimensional system. The, as you'll see in the 3D system, the superfluid density goes continuously to zero at the same point where superfluid, the superflow disappears above. It's quite different situation than the 2D system. <clears throat> so uh, following not too long after uh, the uh, th th theory of these uh, to the transition to the system, uh, we were, did some experiments which showed uh, very clearly that uh, vortices were a dominant feature in controlling the transition or the lack, the disappearance of superflow in the 2D system. Now, it's a matter of <laughs> preference as to whether you call this a phase transition or not. <laughs> but <laughs> Certainly at the time, we didn't think of it as a phase transition. We thought of it just as, as the dynamics of the vortices in the system, which it is, of course. OK. So let me go on. Uh, the first evidence of uh, phase transition in superfluids, actually, we just a very early measurement looking at the density. The density has a, uh, a peak up here, very badly designed device. Anyway, there's a peak in the uh, density. But another feature of the density, which is important to mention, is it's quite small. And as it turns out, this means that hydrostatic effects in the helium are, are quite modest compared to some highly compressible fluid like a, like a system near its critical point. <clears throat> That's important in the heat capacity measurements. And here's the earliest heat capacity measurements, which gave the uh, classic uh, description to the transition of the lambda point for the obvious reason. And here is the uh, of, uh, superfluid density measurement of due to Andronikashvili. It consists of a uh, stack of disks which oscillate early torsional oscillator experiment done, however, at very low frequencies because, uh, because of the sp <coughs> spacing between the uh, disks is not too small. So you were, if you want to couple the normal fluid to the oscillating disks, you have to operate at sufficiently low frequency so the viscous penetration depth 
And the normal fluid, in fact, is larger than the spacing. So then you lock the fluid, but you don't lock the superfluid. So by looking at the moment of inertia of this, uh, Andronikashvili was able to uh, separate the fluid into two parts, the normal part, which gets dragged by the disks, and the superfluid part, which doesn't. And the superfluid part goes to zero at, at the lambda point. So this connects the superfluid properties to the heat capacity properties. And so this is a, a game, well, first I should say that the phase diagram is here. And the reason I put this up is, is point out the slope of the superfluid transitions. The so-called lambda line is not vertical in terms of pressure. It tilts backward. And so this can, tells you how much hydrostatic effects are going to change the transition temperature. Any finite sample of helium in, in this room or anywhere on the Earth is going to have a gradient in transition temperatures from the bottom to the top. I mean, actually from the top to the bottom. <coughs> but you might ask yourself, what's the slope of the line? Uh, it's, uh, not, it's not very steep. It's about one microkelvin per centimeter of liquid height. But uh, in fact, it's possible to do experiments which resolve the heat capacity at almost nano Kelvin resolution temperature intervals. So uh, that means that you would have to have extremely thin sample uh, where surface effects would start to be a, a consequence, so on. <clears throat> so uh, at great expense, experiments have been done in space where you can, in fact, reduce G and therefore reduce the these hydrostatic effects in the sample, uh, so-called microgravity experiments. It's not <clears throat> done in the space shuttle. It's not really microgravity. It's basically free fall. If you want to wear, ask where you have to go to get microgravity in the solar system, you've got to go a long, long way out, and out to the Cooper Belt or someplace, because <laughs> the sun is a very pr provides a strong gravitational attraction. Anyway, but uh, for publicity reasons, uh, NASA decided to call these experiments done in free fall microgravity. OK, we'll go on back onward. So the heat capacity experiments were revisited by Buckingham and Fairbank, and also a graduate student by the name of Kellers who got very little credit for his efforts. But anyway, they discovered the, uh, they had much higher quality heat capacity data and, and showed that at successively higher resolutions, you still maintain a, a very sharp peak, which uh, completely dis, uh, put aside the uh, Australian speculations. So uh, it's, uh, possible to plot the data this way uh, on a, a logarithmic scale on the bottom and a vertical scale on the top. And these are straight lines uh, drawn through the data, which would suggest that it's basically logarithmic. Uh, and for a while, uh, people really believed that the uh, heat capacity of helium at the lambda point, in fact, followed a logarithmic uh, behavior. And this is partially uh, due to a mindset induced by Onsager in his solution of the uh, 2D rising model. And that, that, that monumental bit of work, you know, just uh, the consequences uh, sort of prejudice a lot of views. Anyway, it turns out subsequent measurements that it's not, that in fact, uh, if you look at the critical exponents, what might describe the uh, specific heat, uh, they're not, uh, it's not zero, which would be the case for logarithmic system. And another property of helium, which 
that which disappears at the transition is the superfluid density. And here's a measurement uh, that I made uh, using persistent currents. Uh, the, you, <coughs> I'll say more about it, but uh, the, this technique depends on very much on the stability of the condensate. Because what's done is you create a persistent current with a certain angular momentum. And then just, you just change the temperature. Now, most people say you decrease the superfluid density by raising the temperature. Or you go the other way. You go, increase it by lowering the temperature. What happens to the angular momentum? Well, at the time this experiment was originally done, most people would say momentum is a frictionless fluid. Momentum must be conserved. Well, it's not. <laughs> circulation is conserved, the circulation in the condensate. So you can, in fact, uh, the angular momentum just traces out the superfluid density for you. You go to the transition, it goes down to, towards zero. And if you don't go too close, you can go right back up again in a reversible fashion, back and forth along this curve, showing that the uh, condensate is at least very stable to uh, temperature changes. Uh, both the superfluid uh, density, and if I go back one, uh, the slope of this line. Now, this is a log-log plot, so this is an exponential function, and the exponent is close to 2 thirds. The modern value would be 0.67 two or three, something like that. It's measured with quite high precision. But uh, a game which was played uh, with, uh, with great activity back in the 50s and 60s and was the game of exponents describing critical phenomena. And, uh, and the helium was a wonderful place to look, particularly to expare, uh, look at experimental results, because you could do these really uh, precise experiments and determine the exponents to a high degree. The, uh, so one is going to be looking at the superfluid density. Uh, and these, of course, will be a reduced temperature T, uh, close to the, reasonably close to the transition, <coughs> where you expect the exponential behavior. In any case, so uh, superfluid density would be some coefficient which measures the magnitude, and then they reduce temperature to zeta power, and here's a sort of modern value for zeta. The specific heat can be described by this kind of a function, which is alpha goes to zero, it sort of approximates the logarithm. But there's also a constant which uh, I've left out, which would be added onto this which is irrelevant for the, what we're talking about. And the modern values for the alpha are not zero, but they're small. But they'll be one, zero, one, six, or maybe zero, two, zero, or something like that, but quite small. Uh, there's another uh, thing which is theorists which easy to look at, think of in terms of theory, but quite difficult to measure is the coherence length involving the fluctuations of the system as you approach the transition. This uh, coherence length uh, diverges at the transition with an exponent minus nu. Uh, but there is a theoretical relation between the coherence length and the superfluid density, uh, and supplied by Josephson a long time ago. And, but the important thing here is that the coherence length is inversely proportional to the superfluid density. So, so it expands as the superfluid density is going to zero. And uh, there's another relation which one can look at. It's called hyperscaling, or a really ugly title, two-field scale factor universality. I don't know who thought of that. <laughs> Anyway, this is mostly a Harvard project. 
anyway, it, it allows you to uh, relate the strength of the heat capacity, this alpha prime, this is just for below the transition, uh, A to A prime, rather, uh, to the strength of the, of the, of the uh, correlation length. And the relation, there's a constant, which is on order of one. And then the, the, there's the ratio, there's A prime times the coherence length cubed. So if, and uh, it's possible to do experiments with three-dimensional helium where you can change the coherence length, uh, mainly by working at different pressures. But you're rather limited. The uh, coherence length, remember, it can be calculated from the superfluid density, which can be measured. And uh, others have did, done that and also done precise uh, heat capacity measurements, to, which are required to compute R. And R turns out to be close to 1. In fact, you've got very consistent values about 0.85 uh, for coherence lengths ranging from 3.1 to 3.45 angstrom. So that's a small range. But nevertheless, uh, it's, you might say it's a confirmation of this hyperscaling idea. Uh, it's possible to go much further in terms of changing the coherence length by looking at helium and porous vicor. Uh, the thing is, in porous vicor, you have helium. Uh, it, in fact, behaves like a three-dimensional superfluid, but very low density, because most of the system is just glass penetrated by these interconnecting pores. And there's no long-range structure to the pores. They're just, they're about 100 angstroms in diameter. And there's the, so it dilutes the helium. So it takes its density way down. And by this argument, since rho s is getting very small, this is getting very large. And in fact, it would be typically 30 times larger. Now, it gets cubed in here. So the, and this has to still remain a constant, somewhere near 1. So it tells you that if, if you look at helium and vicor, the heat capacity has to be extremely small. Maybe 1 down by a factor of 10 to the 4th or 10 to the 5th from what it would be in bulk helium. Uh, if I have time at the end, I'll discuss some of the experiments actually verify that. Uh, now here's a picture of the, uh, the gyroscope we used to measure the superfluid density. It, uh, it consists of a torus in which you have liquid helium. In fact, the whole apparatus was immersed in liquid helium. And there's a little hole to let helium get into this torus. And you would actually, could, this could be rotated into the horizontal position. And then you would rotate the whole thing at, some speed above the transition, cool down below, stop it, and you would, be, you would have a circulating persistent current in this torus. And then you would rotate the torus into the position shown here, and then make a slow rotation about the vertical axis. And then that requires a torque along this, this axis, because the angular momentum is along here. So that torque produces a displacement against this little fiber here, which supports the whole thing. So you rotate one direction, it tips a little bit one way. And you rotate the other way, it tips the other way. And uh, the difference took out centrifugal force effects. And, <clears throat> and you could measure the angular momentum trapped in this uh, torus. And so by changing the temperature, you could watch the angular momentum change. and uh, we obtain the superfluid density. There are a lot of other things you could do, too, like study critical velocities, but I don't have time to talk about that. But one experiment you could do in this torus is not fill it with helium, but fill it, but just allow a small amount of helium in the system to form a helium film. And it pr turned out to be possible to create persistent currents in the helium film. But there's quite a remarkable thing happens if you 
create a persistent current with this value of angular momentum when a film thickness of about 20 angstroms, you can increase the thickness, say, holding the temperature constant. You can increase the thickness by adding, condensing in gas, helium. There's no angular momentum in the gas. It goes in, yet the angular momentum measured by the gyroscope increases linearly with the thickness of the film. And in fact, again, like temperature cycling, this is a reversible process. You can pump on the helium and, and lower the thickness. And you go back down this curve. You can go up and down as much as you want. Now, how is that? Well, what it tells you, or the interpretation I have for it, is that the condensate is essentially growing something like epitaxial crystal. It reflects its, the structure of the, as it grows thicker. Remember, these are very, very thin films. You know, we're talking about uh, 40 angstroms. That's 10 nanometers, 40 nanometers, 4 nanometers, sorry. <clears throat> anyway, the structure in the condensate is just propagates itself as it, as it goes thicker. And as, we're, as I say, it's reversible. So it shows, again, this sort of remarkable stability that you can have in the condensate itself. Onward. But so that's sort of the picture in, in three dimensions. You have everything fits together rather nicely. Uh, the exponents uh, agree with each other through the various uh, scaling relations which have been provided by theory. And in fact, uh, theoretical calculations of the numbers for these things, in fact, agree rather well with the experimental numbers. But what about two dimensions? Uh, as well, Michael has given a very colorful and beautiful description of what goes on in two dimensions, basically, with vortices and, uh, OK. So <clears throat> is that gives five minutes for questions? <laughs> OK. He just gave me the time. So, OK, onward. Uh, so we can, uh, we did, we, well, here's the, I won't dwell on this. Here's a vortex in a, in a helium film that basically the basic thing it does is it changes the topology of the system. Without the vortex, it's simply connected. With the vortex, it's doubly connected. And so in films, uh, you, you tend, for energetic reasons, to have a lot of these uh, vortices. Uh, which is very different from the three-dimensional system. There, the transition is really controlled by the fluctuations and the increase in the uh, excitations as you go through the lambda point. <coughs> so, the, well, I could again describe the uh, theory behind the Kossowitz Thales. Uh, and the prediction of the, the earliest prediction was that at the transition temperature, there would be a finite superfluid density. This is superfluid density in aerial terms, so many grams per square centimeter. And there would be a, a bunch of fundamental constants relating the two. <clears throat> so and, and uh, the early results, of course, were uh, enhanced by more rigorous calculations in the mid to late 70s. And in the late 79, in fact, uh, we uh, performed an experiment uh, which was by far the, not the first experiment which showed that there was something funny going on at the, trans, that, that the point where superfluidity disappears in a helium film. But uh, there was the aspect of the th experiment which made it much more powerful than the previous uh, work. So, this is an experiment done in a torsional oscillator, which has been my bread and butter for many years now. Uh, originally, this technique was developed by us for work on helium-3. But it became immediately obvious that you could do helium-4 experiments. Remember, I mentioned the viscous penetration depth. Well, uh, 
you can be up at a kilohertz with helium if, in a porous medium like bicor or in a helium film. The viscous penetration depth is still much, much bigger than the film thickness of the pore size. So that's why you can work at high frequencies. Uh, <coughs> Uh, with, uh, if you keep the geometry small enough. Well, for studying uh, two-dimensional helium, we need two-dimensional surface. And we achieved this by uh, taking a strip of mylar when this, the first apparatus was, we had a 20-meter strip, like, you know, from here over to my timekeeper, uh, about this wide, very thin, a uh, quarter of a thousandth of an inch thick, and we just roll it up. We actually sprinkled some powder on it as we were rolling it to, to provide separation. And then we encapsulated this in a, in a uh, superfluid tight chamber, and then there was a fill line coming down into the apparatus, and it, it would perform oscillations. Here you're looking down out there, two electrodes, one of which drives, it's just oscillations, the other detects it. So that's the scheme of things, and then it can be cooled, in this case, using a helium-3 pot, and in later experiments, using a dilution refrigerator. <coughs> anyway, again, if you perform this experiment, which is similar to the Chester-Yang experiment, of just adding helium uh, to the torsional oscillator. Now, this is different in a sense than the persistent current measurement of the same sort, because in this case, the, uh, the uh, substrate is oscillating about zero, and rather than having a steady flow in the apparatus. But anyway, for low coverages, you find that the uh, period of the oscillator just increases because the mass that you're adding just adds mass, moment of inertia to it, because it's all locked to the substrate. And then you come to the transition, and there's an abrupt change, and you drop down, and then when you continue to add mass, you get, uh, well, ideally, it would go out, there would be no change in the frequency, because it would all be superfluid. But uh, for various reasons, uh, one of which might be that the this uh, jelly roll of, of mylar is, in fact, not completely cylindrically symmetric. That means if it's elliptical or it's slight ellipticity, then part of the helium film gets pushed by the, even though it's superfluid, it gets, still gets pushed by the uh, uh, <coughs> substrate and contributes to the moment of inertia. And, and that is an explanation that can be applied. So this requires sort of about 20% of the effective mass of the superfluid is actually coupled to the substrate. Uh, there are other, you know, imperfections in the substrate might also contribute to this slope. In any case, but more interesting experiments is to, is to look at the temperature dependence. Now here is the period of the oscillator versus temperature. And what we've done is we've adjusted the various coverages so they all agree. This is sort of aesthetics. What was important is at low temperatures, uh, you, have a, you come up and the period of the oscillator increases, but then it jumps up at the transition and then continues. And, the, and this slope here is very similar to the one above. It's slightly different by the sort of 17%. <clears throat> in addition, and now this is the crucial point, it's not just that there's a jump in the superfluid density at the transition, there's also a very significant dissipation peak which occurs. And, and this is the key that really is vortices that are going on because it's, if these pairs which are moving, they and, but they're in response to an AC excitation. And that leads to dissipation, particularly in the re region where they're going from uh, essentially being not noticing the oscillation to where they're completely free. And 
they lock the superfluid to the substrate. So uh, if you look, go back to the superfluid uh, period curves and turn them upside down and subtract out the background and so on, then you get a curve that looks very similar to rho s and bulk helium, but in fact the shape is quite different and it's much, the drop here uh, is much more abrupt and you can sort of, it's arbitrary where you choose the transition temperature to be. Uh, in the early third sound experiments, they didn't see this part of it. They would come along here, then the signal would disappear. <laughs> so they didn't have the problem. Well, I didn't have a problem when I went back and analyzed their data to get the jump, because <laughs> there's only one place to take it. But here you, uh, so we've done, we've uh, measured these jumps, which lie basically along one of those straight lines. <laughs> Uh, to compare with the Kosovo-Salis static predictions. Now, these are not static experiments. They're dynamic experiments. <coughs> and, uh, well, here's just uh, the comparison of the period data with the uh, dissipation data. Fortunately, uh, uh, Ambergallica, Halpern, and Nelson, and Sigia, uh developed a, an extension of the static theory to the dynamic situation. And Steve Pytel here was very instrumental in providing the algorithms to, could you could use to fit the experimental data to the theoretical, uh, uh, to the theory, dynamic theory. Now at the core of the dynamic theory is, of course, the static predictions. And in the comparison to this data, this point right here would be the uh, prediction of where the static jump would be. And because we're at finite frequencies, you're, everything is pushed a little bit out. Not very much, though. You notice what the scale we're talking about, uh, you know, a few percent, basically. But the, the agreement between the, uh, what was observed and what the uh, vortex, dynamic vortex theory would predict is extremely good. So I think this is, the, is a more powerful uh, indication that the Kosovo-Thales theory really is describing the, uh, what's going on in these two-dimensional films. And here's the picture which Mike showed you. And uh, just to finish, I would like to show you another version. This one sits in the Nobel Museum in Stockholm, it uh, had a somewhat circuitous path to the museum. Uh, I don't know that David Thales knew <laughs> what the path was at the time he donated this uh, picture to the museum. But anyway, uh, the person who gave it to David Thales uh, does remember, and that's David Bishop, who's the person who has done these experiments. And this is a plot which even has my handwriting on it here, <laughs> down in here, this is, I, could, I went to the museum to authenticate this thing. But anyway, at the time of the Hansager Prize, uh, David Bishop made a copy of this plot which he had possession, in his possession and presented it to uh, David Thomas. Well, uh, thank you, and that's the end of what I have time for today. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Comments, that's what we want. Okay, then I'd start. <laughs> uh, what was the relative precision that you had to use to determine the, the jump, to, that you needed to determine the, the, the superfluidity? Uh, well, these in the oscillator. Yeah. The, the, uh, the secret of the oscillators is that they're very high Q. Uh, Qs of uh, a million are not uncommon. And so it's very easy to get a high, to lock this thing in very, uh, to measure the frequency up to sometimes part and ten of the ninth. And, and the mass of the helium that couples is, gives you effects much, much bigger than that, more on the ten to the sixth level. So that you've got huge amount of signal for the most part. 
Okay, but your, well, your, your accuracy was you know, 10 to the 9 in the know. experiment. Well, that's, that's when you're really careful. You've got to keep vibrations down and, all, you know, and operate in the right temperature range. I mean, it's, it's a black art. I mean, it, it, uh, these materials that you build the torsion rods out of have their own properties. And in fact, at very low temperatures, a brilliant copper, which is a typical material used, it has a, uh, something quite strange going on. It becomes nonlinear below about 200 millik. And there's, so you have to be careful that you're not looking at that. And so this has been a problem, not so much in these experiments where the signals are very large, but in this, quotes, the, the sad field of super. Uh, super solids. We're looking much smaller effect.